This morning we're in 1 Corinthians 15. I've already read to you the verse that's really we're going to be focusing on, but actually we're going to look at other aspects of, of, of this chapter as well. I want to read from verses 1 through 22, and I think we'll get everything that we're going to be looking at in there. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1, we'll read through verse 22. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. I hope you can get uh, from that passage the importance of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no life. There is no salvation. Now, as you know, today is uh, Easter Sunday. At least those of you who have looked at the calendar, I'm sure all of us are aware of the fact that it is. And even though as a church, we don't necessarily follow a church calendar because the Lord has really only marked out um, one event that we are to follow, uh, we don't pay too much attention to it. But we are familiar with that one event or that one day that the Lord has marked out that we are to observe. And actually, it's a day that we're to observe every single week. It's the day that our Lord Jesus rose from the dead. It's actually a day that he's called by his, his own name. He is the Lord. It's called the Lord's Day. I think I pointed out to you before that there's only two things in Scripture that the Lord has actually called by himself or called by his own name, at least two of the um, ordinances, the two of the commandments, as it were, that we are to observe, and that is the Lord's Supper and the Lord's Day. The Supper reminds us of his death, which we've just read about, and of course, the Lord's Day reminds us of his resurrection. Now, the Lord wanted us to set this day apart. He wanted us to celebrate it every week and not once a year because he wants us to remember something. He wants us to remember his resurrection. By the way, he wants us to remember his death as well, which is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper every week. 
But he wants us to remember his death and his resurrection. Both of them are very important to our salvation, not just his death, but his resurrection as well. Because the resurrection proves that if you have trusted Jesus Christ, that you will live, that you will be saved from death, that you will be saved from hell. Now, the Bible is quite clear on how we are saved, that we're not just saved because we're human beings, and we're not just saved because Jesus Christ came into the world. We're not saved because we're so good. We're not saved by doing good works and making ourselves so attractive to God that he just has to save us. The Bible is quite clear that we are not saved by our works, but we are saved by grace through faith alone. That is, we are saved by this marvelous gift that God has given to us of his son, trusting him. So God's grace gives us his son. Faith is how we receive his son. And again, as you understand it, it has to be by faith alone, simply receiving that gift so that it may be by grace alone. God does all the work. We simply receive it. So we know we're, we're quite clear on what the Bible says about how a person is saved. But how do we know that we are going to be saved? How do we know that trusting Jesus Christ really makes a difference in our lives? How do we know this whole thing isn't just some kind of deception and that in the end, we're going to perish anyway, even though we have believed? Well, there's an event that took place in the history of the world that proves to us that there is life after death, and it proves to us that having trusted in Jesus Christ, we also will live after we die, and that is the resurrection. Paul tells us that the fact that Jesus Christ was raised is the guarantee that you also will be raised, that you are saved from your sins if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you obey him. Now, this morning, I want us to consider two things. The first is the fact of the resurrection. The fact is that Jesus was raised from the dead. I mean, that is very important to this argument, isn't it? If our salvation is based upon that, we have to know it's true. But secondly, we want to look at the importance of the resurrection. Why we need it? Because you are only safe if, in fact, Jesus Christ was raised. Paul tells us plainly, if he wasn't, we're lost. So first of all, let's consider the fact of the resurrection, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with resurrection, let's take a look at what resurrection is. Resurrection is the raising of the dead to life, which is really an amazing thing because we don't, that's not something you see every day. As a matter of fact, I doubt that any of us have seen anything like that. When a person dies, the Bible tells us that our soul or the soul of that individual is separated from their body and it goes to one of two places. It goes either to heaven or to hell. That the soul does not stay in or around the body. You don't have to really worry what happens to your body after you die because you're not going to be around to see it or to feel it. Your, your soul doesn't become a ghost that, that haunts different places or tries to communicate with different people. Uh, people think that that's what happens, but actually the Bible tells us that's not what happens. If you have trusted Jesus, your soul goes to heaven immediately. And if you have not trusted Jesus, your soul goes to hell immediately. But the body goes into the grave, and we're all very familiar with that. The body begins to decompose. Bible says, from dust you have come, and to dust you will return. As a matter of fact, our bodies de do decompose back into earth, back into dust. Now, resurrection is a reunion of the body and the soul. And if the body has decayed, if it's been dead for a little while, it's also the restoration of that body to life, so that one who was dead now becomes alive again. Now Jesus died on the cross and he was raised again to life three days later. When Jesus was on the cross, when he had finished everything that needed to be done in order to save his people, he cried out, it is finished. 
And then he said one other thing. He says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, which means his soul. And at that point, he bowed his head and he died. His soul went to be with his father in heaven. Remember, he told the thief on the cross, the one who repented. They were both unrepentant when it first started. And they were both uh, uh, accusing him and were joining in with everybody else, uh, trying to make Jesus as miserable as possible. But one of them repented. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise, which doesn't mean that he was going to go with Jesus into a compartment of hell, but that he was going to go to heaven, to the paradise of God, to that place which the Lord has prepared for everyone who believes. But where did Jesus' body go? Well, it went into the tomb, it went into the tomb of a particular man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Scriptures indicated that he would be with a rich man in his death and so Joseph, who was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, but secretly because of fear of his contemporaries and his peers, he provided his tomb and said, lay the Lord there. And so that's where Jesus was buried. And if his body had remained in that tomb, that body would have undergone corruption. But again, as we've already read, on the third day, he was raised again from the dead. His soul re-entered into his body, and he was raised again to life. Now, one thing that's interesting is we often think when this angel, as we already read in Matthew 28, descends from heaven and rolls away the stone, that he rolled the stone away in order for Jesus to be able to escape. But that's not the reason why he rolled the stone away. He rolled it away so that those on the outside could go in and see that Jesus was no longer dead especially his disciples, that he had risen from the dead just as he said that he would. Jesus said earlier, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so also the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But only three, Jesus rose again from the dead. Now, I think that you've... Um, You've heard some of the theories that uh, unbelievers have come up with to try to explain uh, how these things could have happened. They at least believe that the events that were written in the scriptures have some kind of truth, that they have some kind of value as, as eyewitness testimonies of what actually took place. How is it that the tomb is actually empty? Well, some of them surmise that Jesus, when he was on the cross, just simply passed out. He didn't you know, actually die, his soul wasn't separated from his body, he was just overcome by the pain, and he passed out. And so when they took him and they put him in the tomb, the coolness of the tomb sort of uh, refreshed him, and he woke up again, and with this newfound strength that he had, he was able to roll away this stone that took several men to actually to put it in place, and he was able to overcome the guards who were guarding the tomb, and he got away a man who had just been beaten so mercilessly and lost so much blood and even had, you know, not just the nails, but also a spear shoved through his side that caused much of his bodily fluid to pour out. That was the man who did all these things. That would be a miracle in and of itself. But that's not what happened. Others believe the disciples actually came by night and they rolled away the stone and they stole the body, somehow being able to evade the guards. As a matter of fact, that was the very story that the leaders of Israel told the soldiers to tell other people. The disciples came and stole him away. But again, how were they able to do that? How were they able to overcome the soldiers? How were they able to, uh, uh, to get Jesus out of there, especially since there was an armed guard that had been set on the tomb to prevent exactly that from occurring? The disciples were not warriors. These were trained men that were given the task of guarding this tomb. Now remember, too, that if the disciples knew, I mean, if this is what they had done, and they, they took the body, they knew that they had done this, they knew it was a deception, we have to ask ourselves this question as well. Why would they be willing to give their lives for this deception if they knew it was a lie, if they knew that Jesus was still dead and this whole thing really was nothing and that Jesus had actually deceived them in that he didn't raise from the dead? Why would they do that? Why would they be willing to give their lives which, as a matter of fact, most, if not all, 
of the disciples did. They died a martyr's death. The reason why they were willing to do that is because Jesus did, in fact, raise from the dead, and they saw it with their own eyes. Now, we have enough evidence from eyewitness testimony to believe that as well as anything else that is based upon eyewitness testimony because it doesn't make sense that it could happen any other way, and these who saw it wrote it down to tell us that it happened. But we have something that's actually more certain than that that tells us that this happened. We do need to remember that this eyewitness testimony that we have in the Bible is not just the word of man, but it is the word of God. And if God has had this recorded in his word, we know with certainty that it has actually taken place. Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus has overcome death. Those of us who are Christians believe God's testimony, and we know it with certainty. So Jesus was raised from the dead. This is a fact. But why is it important? Well, because I've already told you, you are only safe. You are only saved if Jesus was raised from the dead. Paul tells us quite clearly in the text we've just looked at that if Jesus was not raised, that you are still in your sins. That those who have already died, as he said, 500 saw him, over 500. Some of them have fallen asleep. He said, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, those who have died have perished, which I believe he means by that, that they died in their sins and are in hell and not in heaven. He says that if Jesus was not raised from the dead, we are of all men most to be pitied. And why should we be pitied? Because we believe in this delusion that we're going to heaven when, as a matter of fact, all that we have to look forward to is the same thing everybody else in the world has to look forward to who hasn't trusted in Jesus, and that is to perish in our sins. We are only deluding ourselves. But what's the connection between these two things? Why is it that Jesus needed to be raised from the dead before we could be raised from the dead or even forgiven of our sins? I mean, wasn't the life that he lived enough? The Bible says that Jesus lived a perfect life according to God's commandments to fulfill righteousness for everyone who would trust in him. I mean, we need to be perfect to get into heaven, and we have not obeyed God perfectly. How can God let us in? Well, Jesus did obey perfectly. Wasn't that enough? Wasn't his death on the cross also enough for us where he took all the guilt of the sins that were committed by his people, those who would trust in him on himself and then suffered in their place? Why wasn't his obedience and his, de his death on the cross enough? Well, Paul tells us it wasn't. Why is the resurrection important? And this is something we don't often think about, but we really need to think about every Lord's Day. And that is the fact that the resurrection, I heard this, I remember hearing this for the first time in seminary of all places. So we should hear about those things in seminary, but I never heard it from a church. I never heard anybody teach on it. I never heard anybody preach on it. The resurrection was Jesus' justification. That's something that we think he doesn't need because he's perfect, right? Why would Jesus need to be justified? We talk about justification, which means that I'm not guilty and I've done everything right. It's just as though I have never sinned and just as though I have done everything right. That's what justification is. When you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you believe on him for everlasting life, you are justified by his righteousness, his obedience, and by his death on the cross, you are made perfect, absolutely perfect, so that God looks at you in Jesus Christ and he declares you to be just. That is justification. Why would Jesus need to be justified? Well, it's because when he was on the cross, the sins of everyone who would trust in him were imputed to him and he became guilty which means he fell under God's wrath. That's the reason why he was on the cross and the reason why he suffered. He suffered in order to discharge what justice demanded of that guilt of those crimes that were imputed to him. So he did become guilty and he needed justification. 
Well, the resurrection was his justification. It is the declaration by the father that his sacrifice was actually accepted and those sins were actually forgiven, that his work was effective. So that if Jesus, of course, had remained dead, then that would be saying just the opposite. He accepted what Jesus did so that he might become a savior. Now again, remember what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. That's what you and I deserve for our sins. The Bible also says, without the shedding of blood, without death, without this price being paid, there is no forgiveness. Jesus went to the cross. He sacrificed himself on the cross. As we think about every time we have the Lord's Supper, his body was broken and his blood was shed in order to satisfy the Father's justice, in order to atone for our sins, to make peace between God and us. He went to the cross to pay that price so that he might become the source of life to all who, were, who would trust in him. Now, if Jesus was successful and the Father accepted his sacrifice, what would the result be? Well, it would be the reversal of what those sins actually brought about in the life of Jesus, which was his death. Guilt took his life, but the payment of that guilt brought it back. And how could we possibly know whether or not the Father actually accepted what Jesus Christ did? Well, there's only one way that we could know, and that is if we saw the one who was dead raised again to life. The resurrection, the reversal of death is the way that we know the Father has accepted his payment. His being raised from the dead shows that the Father did accept it. And of course, having accepted it means that he is able to give life. Now, if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, that could really only mean one thing. And that is that the Father did not accept the payment which Jesus Christ made. And if that payment wasn't accepted, there could be no forgiveness. Jesus could not guarantee for us the blessings of the covenant. In other words, he could not be a savior because his sacrifice did not even save him. So if he was not raised from the dead, that means that you would have no sacrifice for your sins. You would die without this payment. You would have no mediator to reconcile you to God. You would have no savior, which means that you would perish forever. And of course, if you had put your hope in such a one, pinning your hopes of heaven on him, and he wasn't able to provide, then you would be of everyone most to be pitied because you would be expecting and hoping for this great blessing, but would be sorely disappointed. But the point of what, Je what Paul is saying here is this. Jesus has been raised from the dead. The Father has accepted his payment. Jesus has fully discharged the guilt of your sins. If you are trusting in him this morning, Jesus can guarantee the blessings of the covenant. Jesus is the Savior. He is able to save. And as a matter of fact, he is the only Savior because he is the only one who has made a payment that God will accept for your sins. Nobody else could do it because nobody else is perfect. Nobody else is God in human flesh. Only Jesus could have made the payment. Jesus did make the payment and the payment was accepted. And that's the reason why he is the only savior. The fact that he was raised from the dead is the proof that his payment was accepted. And it is the proof to you that you are safe if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are, all your sins have been paid for. They've all been removed. And because Jesus was raised again to life, you also will be raised to live forever. Now let me ask you this question. Is the resurrection important? 
it is important for your life and for mine. Is it important for you to remember that Jesus was raised from the dead? Is there a reason why God has actually appointed the day that Jesus raised from the dead for all of us to gather together and to worship him? It is important because this is what our eternal salvation depends on, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He does not want us to forget either his death or his resurrection, or his life, or anything else that has to do with him. Jesus is our life, and he is the only way to life. The resurrection is the proof of it. The resurrection, you might say again, is God's declaration of acceptance, and also his declaration to you that if you've trusted Jesus, you will be raised from the dead. You have life now. And you will always have life because you have trusted him. Now, in closing, I just want you to realize what the resurrection means to you if you haven't trusted Jesus. Now, I've already talked to you who have trusted. It is your life. It is, of course, the proof that you are going to be raised from the dead. It's the proof that you have life, that your sins are forgiven now, and that God has accepted you. But what does the resurrection mean to those of you who have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I hope you see in, in what we've already seen that there is only one way of salvation. In order to forgive anyone, God required death. The wages of sin is death, as we've already seen. But the death of a particular individual, and that is his son, his only begotten son, the one whom he loves more than anyone else. The only way that God could forgive anyone is if the payment was great enough to satisfy his justice. Only Jesus could make that payment. Now realizing that the father had to make such a great payment in order to forgive sins, do you think that he can just simply overlook sin? Do you think he can just forget about it? I think some people think that God is, is such a being that all these atrocities can be going on all the time, all these sins, the things that offend him, and he can just say, oh, it doesn't matter, forget it. Well, God can't just say that. The fact that he gave his son to die on the cross to take his wrath upon himself for those who would trust him proves he can't just overlook it because if he could, he would have done so. It requires a very high payment in order to forgive them. So he's not simply going to overlook sins. There is a price to pay, a price to pay justice. The wages of sin is death. And what he means by this is not just physical death. He means eternal death. God's wrath and judgment in hell forever. Somebody has to pay this price. And the Bible says that either you have to pay it or someone else does. Now, the whole point of the work of Jesus Christ is, is simply this, that the Lord is willing to pay. He's already shown that he's willing to pay. He's already made the payment. He suffered hell on the cross. And that payment was already accepted by God. That's the whole point of the resurrection. And the point of the fact that God calls uh, the gospel or commands his people to preach the gospel everywhere means that God is willing to give that to you. It's an offer that is made to everyone, and it is made freely. There's no cost involved. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no work you can do. There's no price you can pay. It's something that he offers as a free gift. That's why we say salvation is by grace through faith. The Lord is the one who does it all, and he gives it as a free gift. All you have to do is simply receive it, trust the Savior that the Lord offers to you in the gospel. Trust him, receive him, and submit to him. Now, is there a cost involved after you've received the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, certainly there is. But it's not a payment that you pay to get to heaven. It is the payment that love demands in return for the infinite love that God gives to you in giving you the Savior. The Bible says that all who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will submit to him and begin to live the kind of life that he calls them to live. And that life is nothing more or less than a life of love. Because everything that God commands in Scripture is 
is simply an act of love. Loving God as, as God and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. And those things that God hates, those things that we call sins, that God calls sin, those are simply acts of hatred toward God and hatred toward your neighbor. So what the Lord is saying is that if you receive Jesus Christ in this free gift of salvation by trusting in him, at the same time you are committing yourself to turn away from your acts of hatred and begin to love in the way that God defines love, which is the only way. And actually, as you read the word of God, you'll pretty much have to agree that what he commands us to do is good and it's right and it's a crime not to do it. The Lord is telling us that if we will trust in Jesus, that is the kind of life that we will be willing to live. So in light of the resurrection, again, on this Easter Sunday, in light of this being the Lord's Day, and the fact that we read these scriptures that reminded us that Jesus was in fact raised from the dead, and that makes him the only savior. He offers you life this morning. Will you trust him? Will you believe on him for eternal life? I'm not asking you if you'll just simply believe these things are true. The Bible says that there are spiritual beings called demons, and they know these things are true. They know that God is, is the true God, and they know that everything that he says is going to take place, and they tremble, but they're not saved by it. Are you willing, believing that these things are true, actually to look to Jesus Christ in faith and trust him to save you? I mean, he died but was raised again to life. He, his body is nowhere on this earth. He is in heaven at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning. And he is the one who has the power of life and death in his hand. And he says that if you're willing to take hold of him by faith and trust him, he makes the offer. How does he make it? Through his word, through his messenger, by his Holy Spirit. He's the one who's appointed this message to be preached this morning. And this is how he makes the offer, at least one of the ways. Another way he does it is through personal evangelism. But he makes the offer to you. Will you trust him? Will you turn from your sins? Will you place your whole hope of heaven on Jesus Christ, on what he has done, on his life, his death, his resurrection? Are you willing to trust him? If you are, the Lord will blot out all of your sins. He'll take them all away. He will give you his perfect righteousness. He will save you. He will give you life that begins now and will never end. So trust in Jesus this morning. He is the only way to overcome death. Remember, that price has to be paid. Either you can pay it or Jesus can pay it. It's a matter of whether or not you're going to trust in him. So trust in him and be saved. Let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask that the Lord would take his word and apply it uh, to us as individuals. Um, let the Lord search your hearts and show you what you need to do in light of what he said.